Hello everyone and welcome to another Real People Big Astronomy program. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I am one of the uh, leadership team members of the Big Astronomy program, which is a National Science Foundation funded project, which seeks to help people understand that it takes many jobs uh, from people around the world with different skills and backgrounds to do big science and to do big astronomy, and that you can get involved in STEM careers with many varied backgrounds. So this program, uh, Big Astronomy, has uh, numerous components. It has a planetarium, a, a planetarium show that was created in both English and Spanish, showing now in planetariums around the world. You can learn more at bigastronomy.org about that. Um, it was also, it also includes uh, hands-on activities related to the project. It includes um, these live ongoing and, uh, event series where we directly connect with STEM professionals who work at observatories and other uh, science facilities. And, and it includes research that's being done by Michigan State University. So uh, if you're interested in any of that, I hope you'll like us on Facebook or uh, follow us on, on social media or, or visit bigastronomy.org. But I'm very pleased to have with us today uh, Andres Palasas who works for the Vera Rubin Observatory. He is a data management software scientist for the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And we talked about the Rubin Observatory last month. This is a really exciting new observatory uh, that is coming online, funded by the National Science Foundation. It will generate up to 20 terabytes of data a night. And it is Andres' job to write software to characterize and eliminate the imprints of the instruments and detectors on that data. So we're excited to learn more about your job today, Andres. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you so much, Renee. It's my pleasure to be here. Uh, if you are joining us here on Zoom, um, please note that there is Spanish interpretation available. So you can select the language you would like to hear at the bottom of the program, uh, bottom of the Zoom window. Um, if you are watching us on Facebook and you would like to hear this program in Spanish, please just go ahead and click on that link and um, you'll be able to pop into Zoom so that you can hear this program in Spanish. Um, and if you'd like to leave us any um, uh, questions, um, go ahead and select uh, panelists and attendees for in the chat box and we'll be happy to answer questions. Likewise, if you are watching on Facebook, um, please feel free to leave questions in the comments section. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up my screen uh, sharing so that we'll have some images to share and this usually takes me just a moment to get all situated properly. but uh, not so bad this time. I think I'm getting better at it. Um, so we're excited to talk to Andres about his job at the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. So the first question we always ask is, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and about what your job is? Because I, I said your job title, but there's a whole lot to a job um, more than just the title. So what it, does it mean uh, to uh, do your work as a data management software scientist? Uh, for the Rubin Observatory. Uh, yes, Renee, thank you. So um, for the Rubin Observatory, we'll be, in the, we'll be building the largest digital camera in the world, which is called the LSST camera. LSST stands for Legacy Survey of Space and Time. And uh, you can see a picture of the focal plane or where all the detectors of that camera are. As you can see that picture on the lower um, upper left of, of this slide. And uh, the Rubin Observatory is going to conduct this uh, survey of the sky, this LSST. It's going to measure all the sky over 10 years, all the sky that you can see from Cerro Pachón in Chile. 10 years, every three days, it's going to come back to the same point of the sky. And uh, this is something unprecedented. And we're going to have such amount of data that the amount of data is not going to be a problem for us. So what's going to be, so to speak, the problem for us? We need to understand very, very well our instrument, for example, or what we call systematic errors, which maybe is a little bit of a technical term, but what it means is we need to understand, as I said, very well our system. So in particular, so we have this very big project by the Noir Lab the, from NSF, from the Rubin Observatory, you have four subsystems. One of them is the data management subsystem. And within there, I am in charge of writing software or writing um, 
code or um, it's like a language where you tell the computer what to do in order to remove uh, all those imprints that or imperfections that you detector could have on, on the science that you want to do. So um, the main motivation um, that you always have science goals, right? So the science, the, the LSST, the Rubin Observatory wants to learn the, about four main science goals. One of them is cosmology, the, the study of the universe as a whole. We wanna know about our solar system. We wanna know about our Milky Way, our galaxy, and we wanna know about um, all those objects that change in the sky in a relatively shorter life time scale, um, like, a, like an explosion of a star. Um, for the type of science that we want to do for cosmology, which is um, observational cosmology, which is the type of science that I'm interested in, um, we need to be very, very careful and study every single detail of our detector. So I'm getting to the point of exactly what I do. So I'm pretty sure that many of you have seen all those beautiful pictures, for example, by the Hubble Space Telescope, well, full of color and very nice. But actually, when you take a picture from, from a camera, it actually looks like something what you see in the middle, more or less. Um, so this is a picture of the same type of detectors that the LSST camera is going to have. And at first sight, it looks like, oh my God, I cannot, do, what is this? So you more or less, you can see the picture of a scientist or an engineer in a lab in the center. But then you see all these imperfections, all these uh, concentric rings, you see different sections. And uh, this is something that we can take off. And then we need to write code. We need to type software to make sure that we actually clean this image to the um, um, re um, requirements that, that we need in order to be able to do the science that we want to. So that's the part of the piece of code that I uh, participate in within the Rubin Observatory. That's so interesting uh, to see the comparison to sort of a standard camera that we all, you know, point and snap, take pictures with, and the massive, massive camera that will be the, um, Secondary mirror, correct, on the uh, the Rubin Observatory. That's right. So this camera, as I said, is going to be the largest digital camera in the world for astronomy, and it's going to have about three thousand two hundred uh, pixels, millions, million pixels, three point two megapixels, three thousand two. Uh, yes, the gigapixels. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit confused here because it's the largest uh, camera in the world that we have built, and compared to the about ten or twenty megapixels that you can have in your in your phone. The technology is similar. It's a digital camera as well that you have in your phone, but here we're talking about that scale completely different. And uh, it's gonna be, it's, it's something that we have not done before. So that's why it is so challenging and at the same time, exciting. Challenging and exciting usually go hand in hand. Um, so we also like to know about your path to where you are today because, uh, and we ask this in particular because we know that, you know, there are so many different ways to get involved in a STEM career um, and that it's definitely not always a straight path for the people I've spoken with at many different observatories um, from, you know, the, some of these big science facilities, people came to their careers in ways they didn't imagine. So um, we just, I'm curious about your path, how you got to be working uh, where you are working today. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, thank you for asking this question. So uh, I was born in Bogota, it's the capital of Colombia in South America. And um, I actually studied physics in, in the university in college. Um, I started actually with uh, industrial engineering. I actually wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do. But during my first semester, I took a class about the history of uh, physics and how it has impacted humanity. And then I decided that I wanted to study that. Then a little bit uh, afterwards in my career, I started to take classes about astronomy. There, there was not an official astronomy in, in, not even in my country. Back in the time, there was no uh, an astronomy major. Right now, there is one in one university in another city. Um, and then I took um, these astronomy classes in, in this university. And then in the last sem semester, I was very lucky and privileged. There's also a, a big component of luck in, in this path. And I was lucky to do an internship in a, um, in a particle accelerator in the United States close to Chicago, which is called the Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory or Fermilab, which is part of the Office of Science of the Department of uh, Energy of the United States government, which is another funding source of the, of the Rubin Observatory. 
And um, after that, then uh, I wasn't even sure that, uh, I didn't even know that if you wanted to, to be an, an academic or you don't want to be a scientist, you should go and get a, a doctorate, a PhD. And that's when my advisor told me, why don't you apply for some of the universities that are part of this project that you're working on? So my internship was uh, studying the detectors of a camera, of a precursor camera to the LSST camera that is called the dark energy camera that is located in a telescope um, right very close to where we're building the LSST camera. It's called uh, Cerro Tololo, close to Cerro Pachon, where we're going to put the LSST camera. And then you can see a little picture of that on the, on the right of that, of the dark energy camera, which has 570 meg, uh, millions of pixels, still a very impressive camera for the standards. So th there are some universities worked in building this camera and in a project called the Dark Energy Survey, uh, which uh, um, at the time, so it, the Dark Energy Survey is, uh, is already done, but it took, um, it, it was, it's a precursor survey of what we want to do with LSST. So I applied for the universities, I applied for grad school to some of the universities that uh, uh, were part of this uh, project. And I got accepted at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So you may recognize, some of you may recognize the skyline of Philadelphia right in the center. And I spent five years there doing my, my PhD, um, specializing on observational cosmology. As I said, cosmology is the study of the universe as a whole, but uh, you can do theory, you can study the detectors, you can do a little bit more experimental or observational in the case of astronomy. Um, and uh, I use, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, but I use a technique called gravitational lensing, which is the bending of light by galaxies or any type of matter. And that lets us know about what the universe is made of. And it's a tool that helps us uh, answer the questions that we have in cosmology. So I spent five years getting my PhD. And then after that, in a perfect world, uh, every PhD would get a permanent position in academia, but there is a shortage of positions in, in academia. So usually people what do, they have uh, temporary jobs that are called postdocs for about two or three years, each postdoc. Uh, it gives you more experience. It allows you to work in other projects. So my first, my first postdoc after I went to Penn was at, uh, at another lab of the Department of Energy called Brookhaven National Lab. It's about two hours away from New York in Long Island. Um, and I kept working on, on this type of, of projects um, related to, to cosmology. Then I did another postdoc in a NASA center called the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in, in California, in Pasadena. It's managed by the California Institute of Technology. And uh, I got involved in a NASA mission called the Nancy Roman Space Telescope that is going to be a space telescope that's going to be launched in, uh, in um, hopefully in five years or so. And it has, uh, it, it complements very nicely with the, with the Rubin Observatory in the same way that the Rubin Observatory was chosen as the most important ground-based project that you can make in astronomy. Uh, the, the Roman Space Telescope, the Nancy Roman Space Telescope was chosen as the most important uh, or the priority project in a space, space-based uh, in, um, in astronomy. So this happened 10 years ago. The, the astronomical community in the United States gets together and then decide what type of projects they should prioritize. So that was my, my second postdoc. And then, uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about this uh, because it's important also for the story. Um, at the time, uh, my girlfriend, now my wife, we were doing long distance relationship for a while and then, she found a job in Washington University in St. Louis. And at some point I decided, uh, okay, I, we cannot just keep going to different cities and, and then, then what? So I, even though I didn't have a job, I moved to St. Louis. Then uh, I was lucky enough to find a job in, uh, in a project uh, that is related to citizen science or community science, which is something that I'm also very interested in. in and um, it, it's uh, maybe people have heard examples of this in which uh, people from the public and the Ruin Observatory is going to play an important uh, role in this type of, uh, of projects. But people from the general public, they, for example, observe images of the moon or craters of the moon, and then they help scientists produce scientific results. So that's, that's something very interesting. And then uh, about a year later, I started working for Princeton University. This is the, now my, my current job. 
so I work for Princeton University, but I do live in the city of St. Louis. And uh, I was uh, my uh, my supervisors. Uh, we reached an agreement that I would uh, work remotely uh, from the city of St. Louis uh, for the as part of the group at Princeton that works for the data management uh, subsystem of the Rubin Observatory. So there are different work groups in different universities, and one of them is the one at Princeton University. So. Currently, I live in in St. Louis, as I said, uh, working for Princeton and the Rubin Observatory. So that's the the long story, more or less. <laughs> but uh, uh, one common theme I have learned when I've been speaking to so many folks um, who work at these observatories um, is that people do they have to move around a lot to work in a, a science field, or it seems like they commonly do end up uh, moving from um, place to place as they're pursuing um their passion to work in astronomy or to work in some uh sort of you know science um field and i and i wanted to mention you talked about working on the um dark energy camera and that it's close to uh where the their rubin observatory is being built and we have spoken on this program with folks who work with the dark energy camera um and who were involved with the dark energy survey um at ctio uh, right next door. So if you're interested in learning more about that, I encourage you to go to our YouTube channel at Big Astronomy on YouTube and you'll see some good um, programs that give an overview uh, of some of other jobs that uh, involve things like the, the dark energy survey and the dark energy camera. Uh, so uh, we also like to ask about what has been the biggest challenge in your career and you know what you did to deal with that with the challenge that you uh biggest challenge that you've faced in your career um, well there are there are many challenges in general on the on the day-to-day -day basis you have to learn a lot of stuff and there are always problems and but it's part of the job right so you need to when you go um to get a degree in physics or a phd in physics you basically learn to to learn so that's those are challenges that are big of course and are very important um, but then one thing that i chose to talk about here is uh, um, i put the maps of, of two countries of my home country and now my new home country the united states because it is very difficult and challenging for a, a person moving away from their family and go to another country to chase their dreams to immigrate to another country. So I don't think people in general want to do that, but for different historical reason, economical reason or cultural reasons, uh, this happens. So it was uh, for, at first, uh, when I got to the University of Pennsylvania, it was a little bit of a culture shock. So I had been already in the United States, as I said, at Fermila, but you know that you're gonna come back, right? Because so it was a lot of fun and it was the summer. And I wasn't, uh, Chicago can get very cold in the winter. So I guess in the summer, it was a lot of fun. But then the next year when I started graduate school, it, it was a little bit challenging, not only because of the culture difference, but because um, my English wasn't that good. I guess I could read English, but uh, you get very nervous speaking in a language that is not your own. And uh, I remember that of the cohort of, of students that got into the first year of the PhD, I was the only international student. So that was very challenging. And um, how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, I was very privileged to have uh, friends. I had a person who didn't know me in Philadelphia. He was uh, he's a Mexican friend. And he just said, I'm going to pick you and you're going to live in my house for the first month. And then you have kind people that actually help you a lot. Then I also, of course, kept in touch with my family, um, talking with them every day. And, um, and that gives you the, the mental support, but of course, not everybody is that privileged or, or lucky, right? So I think that's uh, still up to this day, it's still a, a challenge, even though I'm now building my life here in the US and building a community here. But uh, uh, this is uh, something that is always there, lingering there when you, when you of course, uh, you, you want to chase your dreams, but at the same time, of course, your heart is uh, in many places, right? And uh, it got uh, way worse with the pandemic and all the restrictions. And uh, I haven't been to my home country in about a year and a half. And 
and uh, it's been worse of course you can ask uh, people all from all around the world now international people who live in other time zones at least i'm very lucky that the time in Bogota and the time in where I live right now is the same, but, and it's not that far. It's like a seven hour fly, five, five hour flight, depending on where, from where you're flying for. But um, yeah, I, I would like to say that that's uh, a very big challenge that it's always there lingering up to this day. It's a, I find it to be such a brave thing. People who um, have moved long distances like you have away from their support of their family um, and, and working in a, in a field that requires, you know, communication, uh, as all do, but um, it's, it's, you know, it is a big challenge and, and you've met it. And that's, uh, I admire that. It's a, it's a, um, it's hard to be a professional, I imagine, when you are also learning how to be, <laughs> just even how to be in the country. So that's amazing. And like you said, uh, lucky to have the support of the of friends around you. So we could always, yes. I'll use the, that support. We have a question from a, one of our viewers on uh, Facebook. Um, Kelly wants to know uh, if it's frustrating to contribute to a project that may not launch for years later, I think um, referring to the telescope that you worked for when you worked, uh, the project for the, the, that you worked for when you were at JPL. Uh, wondering if it is um, frustrating to contribute to a project that like that, that you might not see come to fruition for a long time. Um. I guess um, no, it's it's not. You don't think it like that because I'm I'm used to that type of projects in in astronomy or in academia. I guess that if, for example, in industry or in other uh, types of jobs, I guess you have shorter scale projects. You are, are more well defined. Um, for example, the dark energy survey. I knew I was involved in the dark energy survey in 2006, and we only started taking data until 2013 or something like that. Um, it can be frustrating, uh, the funding, you know, every year. Uh, there, there's a funny story with that. This telescope was called W first before, which stands for a wide field infrared survey telescope. It's, it's wide field because it's going to be 100 times the field of view of the Hubble Space Telescope with the same resolution. So it's going to be awesome and great. But then every year in Congress for a few years in the past government, it would get canceled. <laughs> so it would get canceled by the, the executive branch of the government, by the president. So it still has to go to, to the Congress. And so in Congress would get, uh, uh, it, would, it would be saved, right? So that, that could be frustrating. And uh, it's always the, the funding, the source of funding for academic projects. Uh, but in the long term, um, right now I'm focusing on the Ruin Observatory. I do still keep uh, touch and uh, in touch and collaborate with my colleagues from JPL, for example. Not at the same level, of course, because I'm focusing on the Ruin Observatory. But and, and there are a lot of synergies at the same time. So I still, even if it's going to take a lot of time, it's fine, I guess, because we're we're used to that. And I'm still going to be working on it in in a way or right or in a way or, not, or another. I know. A lot of scientists are thinking about how to use the data from the Rubin Observatory, from the Roman Space Telescope. Um, there's a, the European Space Agency has some similar telescope, or well, maybe not similar, but it has a, a space mission that is complementary that is called Euclid that is going to launch sooner. And then all these surveys have uh, similar uh, uh, scientific goals and then you have a lot of people thinking about how to make the best out of them they're complementary that's why we do different things um, but at the same time you want to put all the data together so in in, in the end it's great to know that i've contributed to this project or this other project even if it hasn't launched yet but uh, it will be great when it when it does one more question regarding um sort of your path and where you live um and then we'll we'll move on so we can keep keep going but um uh, in Zoom, uh, Nicole wants to know about your favorite United States city you've lived in. What was your favorite and why was it your favorite? Um, I love California, <laughs> Southern California. It's maybe because of the weather, I guess. Uh, it's just I was born in, uh, in the tropics. Bogota is right in the tropics, but it's not humid and hot because it's 2.6 kilometers above the sea level in the first, in the second slide. I showed the motto of the city, which is 2,600 meters closer to the star. And that's about, it's more than 8,000 feet. And it's about the same height at which Cerro Pachono, Cerro Tololo are actually in Chile. It's more or less, they're, they're about at 
kilometers above the sea level. Anyhow, but I really like the weather of Southern California because you, I'm not used to seasons, even though I've lived, uh, this is funny because I always tell this to my friends and I always complain about the summer and the fall and the winter and it's beautiful and all that in, in, in theory, but in practice, uh, we don't have the four seasons in the tropics as you have in a temperate zone. You have a rainy season or a dry season. So I like that. But uh, also I like that in when I was in Southern California, uh, there are a lot of uh, world-class ast astronomical uh, um, institutes. Um, you can say the same about Chicago as well and, uh, and, and, and in, in Philadelphia. But then in the end, I like the weather. It's just, just because of that. But but in the end, uh, I mean, now I live in St. Louis and I'm happy here because I have my family and I can work uh, remotely. And uh, so, yeah, so independent, you, you, you make it your own and then you, you're happy <laughs> where you are. <laughs> you bloom where you're planted, right? Uh, so the, our next question is, um, what is your favorite thing about your job and why? Right, so I put out a lot of, um, pictures here then I want to remind myself the favorite thing I'm very curious so this is another theme of my life it's simple but that's a driving force in my life curiosity and in my job I get to learn every day something new I get to read papers um, in my field even within my field you know you have a PhD but you don't know anything everything so you keep learning and then it's very cool stuff uh, um, so at that and, and also I like that I get to do science communication. That's what I put, um, uh, that's a picture of me speaking in an, an, an event called Astronomy on Tap, which is a, an event where professional astronomers give talks in, in bars. And I was uh, able, I, I started doing this in Pasadena, but then when I moved to St. Louis and to, New, and to Princeton, then I found the two satellite locations of this because I enjoy doing science communication uh, because it's sharing the excitement of what I think is cool about cosmology or astrophysics with the general public, which in general are very interested about uh, this. Um, also, I, I have had the luck and privilege of traveling around the world for, for astronomy in academia. You usually travel a lot, which, uh, which is great. And at the same time, now the pandemic has made us re reflect on it. And of course, that's not good for your carbon footprint. So there is a balance to, to reach. And of course, I haven't traveled in, I don't know, two years or, of course, because you, you need to be safe. But I really enjoyed that. And then I also enjoy that I get to work with people that are way smarter than me. So I can learn a lot from them <laughs> in, in different access, right? It's not only smart in from the analytical point of view, but also people who maybe are more outgoing or who have different visions. And then I really try to learn from different cultures from all the parts of the world. So I guess there is a lot of a strength in this diversity and I try to soak from, from that and, and learn. Um, I also put a picture of, of the sky in Chile, that's Cerro Tololo, that's the, the, the telescope in the center is where the dark energy camera is. It's called the Victor Blanco telescope. It's a four meter telescope. And, and it's just amazing and it's a privilege again. And I keep saying this word privilege because you gotta check your privilege and know that actually I've been very lucky and to be in a place like this. So I've had the chance to be, to travel a couple of times to, to Tololo and it's, it's amazing. So that's great. And the, the other thing that I enjoy a lot is, is the mentoring part. So right now I'm part, I'm, uh, um, co-organizer of, uh, I, I collaborate in the internship program at, at Princeton University, but then with other colleagues from Colombia, we're doing a virtual internship program, which is called this RECA in Spanish means the Colombian Network of Students in Astronomy. And uh, we are giving the chance of people who usually don't have an REU or they don't have like a um, uh, a research opportunity when you're an undergrad, when you're applying to grad school, it's, it's good for them to have this uh, research of this experience in the same time, in the same vein that I have, uh, that I had the opportunity to go to Fermilab when I was an undergrad. So I, I enjoy also this part, this mentoring part. And uh, so it's, it's all these parts together. And and yeah, there's, there's a lot of, of that that actually motivates me. And I think it's, it's cool, very nice. 
it's lovely too that you've talked about being lucky and feeling privileged and um and i think there's yeah everyone should recognize the things that we are lucky about and you know how we are privileged but uh, when you are you're giving back to uh, the students who like you in columbia and uh, that's a look a lovely way to say sort of show your show your gratitude for for the um uh, benefits that you've been given over the years um so then we always like to ask the other side of the coin so we ask about your favorite thing about your job so what about your your least favorite thing about your job um yes okay there are some things that of course that can be frustrating um so one of them from the practical point of view uh, you can see the picture on the left there is a magnifying glass and a bug and in, in when you're writing code, when you're telling the computer what to do, if you write the wrong thing um, or you make a mistake, it's not going to work. And that's going to that's called finding the bug. It's called a bug, you know, for historical reason, when you had these huge computers that were like occupying the whole room back in the 60s, 40s or whatever, they actually had physical insects or bugs going into the computer and then that would uh, mess things up. Nowadays, it's, it's a mistake, yeah. It could be a mistake in the algorithm, it could be a misplaced uh, comma, it could be the computer is not gonna work, the, the, the program is not gonna work. So uh, sometimes I could fi find it frustrating, you know, it depends on the mood on where you are. I guess it's, it's it could be like a zen, like a zen process in which you, okay, breathe, try, you're gonna find it, it's part of the job, it's gonna be okay, but some other times it can be very frustrating. And, uh, then uh, in more in the big picture things and um, it has to do with the fact that science doesn't happen in a vacuum and uh, one thing that uh, for example physics and astronomy and physical science suffer is inequity and injustice and if you analyze the data for example these are just two examples the two charts that i show on the on the left there are examples of how if you look at the number of people who have gotten, for example, a, ba a bachelor's degree in physics in, uh, in, uh, in the United States, and then you disaggregate that by, by race or uh, gender, you're gonna find uh, that the numbers don't match in a population in which, for example, you have a certain demographics in your, in your country, you're gonna see a lack of representation in physics. And that's a, that's a huge problem that we need to talk about. Sometimes it has led us to having uncomfortable conversations but you need to get comfortable being uncomfortable right so it can be frustrating sometimes because sometimes don't there are colleagues who don't think that you should do anything towards this um that doesn't mean that everybody's like that there's a, a lot of people who actually want to work and enact change but you need to actually get committed to do this type of systemic change that that is is needed in in astronomy and this is not only of astronomy. This is a reflection of what happens in society in general. So, so that can be frustrated and frustrating uh, when you look at the at the data. But uh, but there is uh, hope and, and a lot of work to do at the same time. And then one thing that I mentioned before is uh, what is called here as the two body problem. So it's in a way it's a play of words because in in, in celestial mechanics uh, you have what is called the three body problem, which is a problem in in Newtonian mechanics when you calculate the orbits of the solar system and it gets complicated. But here the two body problem refers as what I said, like if I am married to a person that is their own person, I have their own dreams and they, they want to do their own career, then that's it because academic jobs they're very scarce then you would need to make a decision like what are we going to do are we going to are you going to stop your career and then you're going to follow me which is what it was expected for example in the past of in physics professor if you're a man you're so you were expected that your wife was going to follow you i think um uh, even dr rubin i think had to do that at some point in, in, in her life so even the language that you use that you call it a problem just having a family you're calling it a problem so that's already telling you about the um the systematic and the structural uh, things that should change in 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 your field and I, I don't want it i mean of course i wanted to say it is uh, complicated and it's grave but not everything is bleak right we the first step is we need to look at the data and we need to recognize the problem and then we need to sit down and think what to do and then we need to act on, on what to do and over the past year and even the past few years we've been having this type of conversations 
in my department at Princeton University and also as well in the in the Rubin Observatory. And the problem is, is like you said, kind of systematic, um, but it's, it's great to see that it's being um, studied and we can apply science to this problem in science and, and try to correct um, for some of these inequalities um, and problems. Okay, so this is an easier question. We always like to ask um, about your favorite astronomical object. What is, you have a couple here, but what are your favorite astronomical objects? I have a couple of here and I guess it's changed over the time. I think I forgot to include one when I was in college. I was fascinated by what is called the Ring Nebula. And we had a 40 inch telescope in the university where I went to. And the sky from Bogota is really cloudy. It's not good for optical astronomy, but on the very clear nights, you can see a little ring. And I was very fascinated to me back in the time. But then the, the pictures that I chose to to put here is one of them is gravitational lensing on the left. It's not like a particular object. I don't even know the name of this galaxy cluster. But what we see here, you see these ellipses, these yellow ellipses, and that's a group of galaxies. It's what you call a galaxy cluster. That is very, very far away. Um, could be hundreds of uh, millions of light years. And uh, that uh, cluster of galaxies is uh, distorting the space time around it. And in such a way, what does that mean? That if you have another galaxy in the background, which is um, um, very, very far away, when the light from that galaxy in the background passes nearby the galaxy cluster is going to be bent. And this is the idea behind gravitational lensing. So here you can see it uh, um, as these ar arcs that are blue. That's actually the same galaxy that is bluish and is very far away, that it's been distorted and bent uh, thanks to this uh, effect. So this is, very, this is a very important effect because it, it uh, is one of the main tools that, for example, the Dark Energy Survey or the Rubin Observatory, the LSST, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or the Roman Space Telescope, they're going to use this technique to learn more about uh, what we call dark matter and dark energy, which are two components right now in the universe, which make up about 95% of the universe, but we have no idea what they are just to, to make a long story short. So, but gravitational lensing is actually giving us a handle to see the invisible. And uh, that's why I like this phenomenon. It's beautiful at the same time, because in the, the theory, um, you need the way of Albert Einstein to think about gravity, which is the best way of, that we have of thinking about gravity right now, the most, uh, close to, to nature, but that, that there is another way of thinking about gravity, which is the way that Newton taught us. That doesn't mean that uh, it's wrong, that we don't use the way that Newton, Newton taught us. Actually, NASA, or if you're going to send something to Mars or something, you use the equations of, of Newton, of Newtonian mechanics. You don't use all the machinery of, of what Albert Einstein taught us. But for this phenomenon, if you want to actually get it right, a prediction that you can compare with observations, you need this uh, way of thinking of gravity that Einstein uh, taught us. So, the, and in particular, I put this picture because it looks like a happy face and, you know, <laughs> so that's, I think is, is pretty cool. And then on the right, I am, there is a star called, called Arcturus. And uh, it's, a, it's the brightest star in the northern celestial hemisphere. It's the fourth uh, brightest star across the whole sky. And uh, it's, a, it's a red giant. It has about the same mass as the sun. It's about, um, um, I forget how many light years, but it's not that, that far away. Yeah, it's a few dozens of, of light years, tens of light years away from, from our solar system. But I like it because um, we recently had a, a sun about five, five months ago, and we wanted I wanted to have a name related to astronomy, and we put we named him Arturo. That's his uh, middle name. So um, the same name, way my middle name is Alejandro. His middle name is Arturo. In we wanted to put uh, something related to astronomy, and uh, and then you can see here sometimes you, in the if you're in the northern hemisphere in the United States, you you can identify the Big Dipper, which is like a pan, like a handle. And you look at the handle, and then you, you actually, if you follow the arc, you get to Arcturus. That's the that's the mnemonic. Follow the arc to Arcturus, and then you can see it very bright. 
these days. So these days, this is my favorite astronomical object because of that reason. That's that's very nice. I know a couple of people who have named their um, their children after something astronomical related. So I have a a coworker. I work at the at a museum. I have a coworker whose daughter's middle name is Myra. Uh, for a star, and um, I have a daughter whose name is Stella. So, <laughs> oh, yeah, nice. Myra is another red giant, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, so uh, we do have a couple questions that are coming in, but I think we'll go ahead and um, sort of answer some of these questions we have uh, pictures for, and then we'll answer more of our questions that we have in our chats at the end. Um, so, I uh, we like to ask about a typical day at work, knowing that probably you don't necessarily have every day the same, but what, what happens in, in your work day? That's right. So every day is not the same, but uh, a lot of the work that, uh, that I do has to do with what I just already said, which is writing software for the Ruin Observatory for this part that uh, uh, takes care of cleaning the instrument, for example, so we can do the science that we want to do. Uh, we're at the moment in which we're uh, almost there in, in construction and then we're at the moment in which you have all these different subsystems of the Rubin Observatory. The, the data management subsystem is the one that I mentioned. There is another one, which is the construction of the telescope that you need to put everything together, which is called integration. So that's the type of job that I've been doing recently. So in, I, I've been writing a, a lot of software, a lot of code. With, I do it in, in Python mainly. It's um, a particular uh, programming language, um, but then as an uh, as an academic and as a scientist, uh, I'm also interested in in scientific questions. So I I use data from, for example, from the lab where we use, where we built the LSST camera, which is a lab of the Department of Energy called SLAC, close to Stanford University. So there's data of that camera of that camera, and then you can study the the, the effects, and then you can actually write uh, papers when you're a scientist you need to one of the most important things is to communicate your science to other scientists and that's how you build the, the knowledge if you don't publish your science then it's like if you didn't do anything so i put a, an example uh, of my one of my papers of when i was a postdoc at, at brookhaven national lab is one of the technical papers is right there in the in the upper right um, i read a lot of papers of course from other scientists Sometimes I serve as a referee for a, an astronomical journal, which is the process of peer review, which is fundamental to, to astronomy. I also um, do science communication. I already do put, put this, this picture where I was talking in astronomy on tap. I do it science of communication in different ways. I do it both in English, in Spanish. I do translations from results from the Dark Energy Survey uh, with a colleague uh, um, from, a, a colleague who's an expert in science communications we're thinking about launching a podcast in Spanish for astronomy and that's been in the works for a long time but uh, at some point it will happen um, I'm also part of another collaboration that is called the dark energy science collaboration so at some point you're going to have all these acronyms that almost look all seem all the same so we have talked about the dark energy survey we have talked about the legacy survey of space and time and that LSST, depending on the science that you want to do, there are eight science collaborations. And one of them wants to know about the nature of dark energy, which is uh, the substance that is causing the universe to expand in a faster way. I, I, I said that we don't know what it, what it is, but it's uh, about 70% of everything that is in the universe. So there is this dark energy science collaboration. I do a lot of work uh, in there, but also a lot of service work. I'm the chair of the meetings committee, for example. So last week we had a virtual meeting and I had to, with other people, no, organize that. So there is, there is all these things, you know, I need to code, I need to write the papers, I need to read papers, do science communication, do service for the community and uh, do some mentoring at the same time. So it, it depends on, on the priorities, but that's more or less. Sometimes I get to go to the telescope. In the past, I have get to go to, for example, when I was at Fermilab, I was at the lab almost every day, taking data inside the lab. So that's the type of things that I do in, in my job. Uh, we have a, a good question from Nicole. She wants to know, is learning code part of your schooling or did you learn that on your own for your job? So when I was in, that's a great question. When I was in school, I, uh, as part of the physics curriculum, it was to take one programming language class, 
it was called C. It's just uh, like the letter C. That's it. <laughs> it's a particular. It's another language of uh, a programming language. I learned that it wasn't my favorite uh, topic, which I'm probably gonna mention in the next slide. Uh, but then when I moved to grad school, there were many other languages that I didn't know. I didn't know Python. Formally, I didn't took a class in Python. So what you do is either you read a book or read a paper, or nowadays you just go to YouTube for the, or you do it hand, hands on and you learn it on yourself. My, my supervisor, my grad student, when I was a grad student, my supervisor, he was programming in another type of language, which is called C++, like another iteration of this language C. And I just had to learn it, sit down by myself and, and learn it. And, and as I said, a lot of the of the, of the job is to learn how to learn or to just yourself uh, do it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing what you'll learn as you learn how to learn. <laughs> um, yes. So then we ask um, about the you know, again, the other side of the coin. So what about, uh, we like to know about people's lives because people who work in science are whole people. So they have lives outside their jobs. So what's, what's a day in the, your life at home like? Um, yeah, so now with the pandemic, that's very um, almost the same, but uh, <laughs> they, they, they usually starts um, uh, waking up. Well, we, we have to spend a lot of time taking care of, of the baby, of course, that uh, in, in, in our life that we recently we had. Of course, he has a priority, but uh, also in the morning before I start working, I take out my dog. That's my dog, Katla, on the left. <laughs> then I usually make lunch for the day in the morning. That's why you have Super Mario as a chef there. Uh, then I start working and, you know, I sit down in in my desk and we have different arrangements but sometimes in the middle of the day then we have to stop and take care of the baby or take him to the doctor so now things are a little bit more intertwined um then at the end of the day i uh, we have we have been very lucky and privileged that we have a park a big park within walking distance just a few blocks away and we just take a walk over there like and, and, and relaxed and enjoy. And then before making dinner, I also enjoy cooking dinner with my wife. And now things have been turned a little bit upside down again with the baby, but it's normal, but that's the kind of things that I do. And, uh, and then here and there with, with the support of my family. Uh, and then I, I have the time to do other things like my hobbies, which maybe I will talk about later in the last slide. Yeah. I was thinking when you uh, talk about your um, day at work and all the projects you're a part of and the outreach you do. And then I thought, oh, and you just had a baby. <laughs> so how do you fit it all in? It's, it's a challenge for sure. Um, okay, so yes. Oh, oops, I skipped one. What was your favorite subject in school when you were studying to, uh, for your career? Um, okay, I, I really like math, despite my face, my picture here, it was just, <laughs> that's just a funny picture that I found from grad school. I think that was a quantum mechanics uh, homework. But when I was in high school, I really liked almost every subject. And I was very curious and interested in everything. And it was part of the reason why I wasn't sure what I was going to study. And for some reason, I studied, I, I enrolled in industrial engineering <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Um, but I really enjoyed uh, math, uh, chemistry, uh, history, you know, that was very, very, I was very curious about, about every, every subject. Um, sometimes, um, yeah, so maybe, I, I really, I guess I really got like more math, I guess, and calculus and algebra. So in the end, I went for science and physics, but I really enjoyed all the, the subjects that I had in, in school. Most of them, as I said, because now the next question is, what was the least favorite subject yeah. in school? So, so I really liked art. So I put this picture, this uh, kind of psychedelic picture here. But I like I like art and I like drawing. That was an elective. But I don't think I was very talented. So I, I did my best. I enjoyed it, but it was a large source of frustration. And then, as I mentioned before, then in school, then on the right, that's uh, a piece of code. And then that's my university in Bogota. I, I actually didn't enjoy coding that much. And now that's what I do for a living, most of it. So it was kind of interesting because I, I actually prefer to go and read the books and the other subjects instead of spending the whole afternoon trying to make the code work. 
Now I have changed my way of thinking about it because it's actually pretty cool when you get to do amazing things, when you know how to code. When you learn how to code, actually everywhere you look now in the world, more or less, it's, it's a, a piece of code is behind that. And you can accomplish amazing things if you understand what you're doing. And basically you're telling the computer to do all these things for, for you. And now with machine learning and artificial intelligence, um, it's, it's very cool and interesting at the same time. But in school, I was more interested in, in the theory part, in reading more the, the concepts and not spending the whole afternoon or the whole day trying to find a bug, for example. So I, I found it sometimes a little bit frustrating and, and that was one of my least favorite subjects. But I find that no. so interesting um, that you didn't like it in school, but you learned to like parts about it uh, now. And it's what you do for your, for mostly for your job. So that's, that's not what I would have expected you to say. And I, and I love it. <laughs> Okay, so this is our last um, slide of questions, and then we do have just a few visitor questions uh, or uh, a viewer questions here that, to finish up. But we like to know what you like to do for fun. So there are a lot of things, so I didn't know what to put, so I put just a lot of pictures. So <laughs> I wish I had more time in the day. I like to read books. Now it's uh, um science books or science fiction books so that's like one picture there i like to i like to watch uh, tv i like to watch japanese animation anime or read japanese comics manga i like to play soccer a lot so that's uh, also very cool i like to play video games when i had the time so that's me in, in a costume of a video game character Mega Man. I also, I'm, I'm very curious and I like to try different things. So that's me flying a plane. I learned, I got a, when I was in, in California, I got um, um, a license as a pilot, a private pilot license. So I, I got the, the chance to, to do that. So that was, was pretty cool. I also like learning new languages. So I, I learned the French when I was in, in school and in college and then when I moved to St. Louis I kept learning and now I study Japanese I've been studying Japanese for a while but I, now I do it via Zoom and then I also recently started learning Russian as well after we went with my wife to the World Cup uh, in 2018 so that's so I like I like that I find it very interesting learning new languages I like um, listening to heavy metal a lot and I go to concerts back in the time when this was a safer activity. <laughs> so that's me going to an Iron Maiden concert, one of my favorite bands, and then they're gonna release an album soon. So I'm very excited. And I try to learn new, new things, you know, whenever I kind of like try to do board games or that's me climbing. I don't do climbing often and I haven't done it that often in my life, but I really enjoy it if there's something new. I like to try it. And then the last picture right there is somebody playing Japanese uh, drums, which is called Taiko for this summer. I don't know if this is gonna become like a uh, thing in the future, but at least for the summer, I, you know, I'm in, the, in a Taiko class just to learn how to do it. So there are different things and a lot of stuff. And, and you know, and uh, I've been lucky that, um, that I have had the support of my family now that we have the baby to try to figure out how I can continue to do these type of things because it's it's a compromise, right? Of course, that is the responsibility of a new human being and in my work, but at the same time, I also enjoy these things that are important for my life. So we, we make it work. <laughs> All the balance. Well, I have fingers crossed that you get to go to the Iron Maiden uh, concert once again um, and that maybe yes. they'll tour if they release their new album so okay. that you know, the world situation gets better for all of us. We can return to those things we love to do. Uh, we do have just a few uh, questions now um, from people who are watching either on Zoom and on Facebook. And um, so we'll see if we can answer some of these. Um, Steven wants to know, what effect might thousands of low Earth orbit satellites have upon research with the new Rubin telescope? And he also wants to say uh, thank you. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, so there are people more qualified than me that have studied this. There are papers written on this. Recently, there was a, um, a conference called SATCON 2. There was a SATCON 1. And um, 
And uh, one of the things that you study is the, the magnitude of these objects, if they're in low orbit or if they're in high orbit. If the, so there is an, an optimization. There is something that you can do. You can quantify it. The problem is uh, um, with the Rubin Observatory, for example, we have this huge camera which has a large field of view. And then these uh, things are going to be right in the middle of, of it. And uh, for certain scientific things, you can just write code to fix it. But then there are other types of science objectives that even if you fix that with your algorithm, uh, then that those pixels or those picture elements or those that piece of data of your detector, then it's, it's not going to be good enough for the science that you want to do. Um, because in the past, we've always had like satellites or, or plane trails, and we can write an algorithm. We can tell the computer to find them and to, to just fix it. But uh, this is going to be a problem. It could be from the scientific point of view, they can be too bright that they actually do what is called the saturation of the detector because they have a finite amount of charge that they can hold. So at some point, it's like a bottle of water. At some point, it just spills over. So that's another thing that you can take into account. And it depends on the type of science that you want to do. These things are going to start. Um, now every rich person has their own company, and then they want to launch thousands of them. So it's not only a star, uh, what is it called? A star link. But then you have the person from Virgin, and then the person from Amazon, and then the, it's going to be all that. And then there are other questions about that maybe it could be sound trivial, but actually as important as like, does the sky belong just to a handful of people? What happens to the right of people to actually enjoy the sky? And um, there are no regulations. There is a lack of regulations. Many of these people are from, from uh, one of the most powerful countries in the, United, in, the, in the world, the United States, and they're making a decision for the rest of the world. And um, that's, uh, I don't think that should be the way that it's, it's done. So there are these considerations, like from the technical point of view, it might not be the end of the world, but at the same time, there, are, there is some science that might get ruined. Um, but there are also these other considerations that are, are as well as, as important, so. Uh, from what I've heard from, from you and from others who work at these observatories, uh, it's definitely being studied and worked on because uh, it, it'll continue to probably grow um, the, the satellite uh -huh. being, being launched. Um, so one, uh, more, one more question from uh, one of our viewers here. Uh, Amanda says that she worked um, with, for the microscale of MRI brain scan analysis for imaging science at Johns Hopkins University and is curious uh, because of her work with that um, what similarities there are in the math code with the image analysis um, from that and from a telescope because she never thought there could be similarities in what she did to astronomy but it's still image analysis um, and so it's just curious about what it is involved in making uh, the image a high a qu a quality image uh, in your work so the similarities here, I I don't know exactly, so I'm not gonna invent. I, I can make some some guesses. I'm big of th there is some information that, that I have. There are uh, uh, certain uh, programming languages or certain uh, mathematical techniques that you can use. You, for example, you can calculate. You want to calculate correlations between galaxies, and the galaxies are usually distributed not in a random way, but in what is called the cosmic web along filaments of of dark matter. And sometimes from, if you study at a certain scale, it could have some resemblance to structures in the human brain, I would think. Um, so you would need to quantify that mathematically doing correlation functions and uh, using that there are um, this, for example, this could be a, a similarity in the way in which you use mathematical techniques and apply it in, in different ways. And this is the power of mathematics, of course, it's just abstraction that you can apply in different in different problems. I knew when I was in grad school, I had to learn a language called IDL, uh, which I knew. Um, now I use Python, I don't use, as I mentioned, but this language IDL, which was called inter interactive data language. And I knew that it was used as well in, in medicine, for example. So that's, those are the two pieces of information that, that, I, that I have. But uh, I'm pretty sure if we do a, a more in-depth search, we would find more similarities, at least in, in, the, in the pure mathematics. 
and then in the actual techniques that are implemented for doing this type of of image and analysis because we're doing a lot of image and analysis right like image convolution and point spread function and all this this stuff well, uh, thank you so much, Andres. I really enjoy hearing from you today, not only about your job, but just as your perspective as somebody who has, um, you know, immigrated to the United States and then it's working in a science field. I enjoy hearing about those, the challenges and how you've overcome those challenges. And also I enjoyed hearing about um, your perspective on, you know, how we can all do better for each other by uh, fostering diversity and inclusion in the fields that we all work in. So that was really lovely to hear from you. Um, and we have a lot of uh, folks who have said they have en enjoyed it here on Facebook as well. Um, so if you enjoyed this program and you would like to learn more about the Big Astronomy Project, I hope you'll take time to either like us on Facebook if you haven't yet or, or visit our website. Um, we'll be putting up a link to a survey that you can take um, that will help you uh, contribute to the research that's being done on this project. Um, if you fill out the survey, we, we will get some data about how you're using these programs and, um, and it will help us uh, with the research that we're, educational research that we're doing on this program. And um, you can find out more information about that at bigastronomy.org as well. Our next, next program is coming up in August and it is going to be a panel discussion about how we have, uh, about resources that we have available for teachers. So um, they'll be, we'll be putting up information about that on our Facebook page too uh, soon. Information about um, how you can use the flat screen version of the Big Astronomy film in your classroom and other resources that we have available. So thank you so much for everyone for tuning in. We hope that you have enjoyed the program today. And uh, thank you. Let's give Andres a, a round of applause. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your good questions. And thank you, Andres, for sharing with you, us um, about your job and about your life, um, because it was a very enjoyable program. Thank you so much, Rene. It was great to be part of this program. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.